Hello everybody, I'm Christoph Bergmeier. I'm a lecturer in data science at Monash University. Um, and today I'm going to speak about SSC, uh, that is a package, an R package for semi-supervised classification um, that I actually implemented with, my, uh, with, with people from Spain and from Cuba. So I did my PhD in Spain before coming to Australia. So that's basically work we did back then. Um, and well, it's, it's a pretty um, major package actually. So it's on CRAN, it's ready to use. You can get it from there if you're interested to do semi-supervised classification. And I think the first thing I want to talk about is maybe what is semi-supervised classification? I mean, many of you maybe know, others maybe don't. So the idea is basically, well, I mean, obviously, you know, supervised, unsupervised, so semi-supervised is somewhere in the middle. So the idea is basically um, you have some instances that are labeled and others that are not, right? And, and now the idea is, well, uh, instead of only using my labeled instances, maybe my unlabeled instances can also tell me something about the feature space that is useful, right? So in this example, you see that is only having some labeled instances and a lot of unlabeled instances, you, you're still like using the unlabeled instances, you, you get a lot better idea of what the feature space actually looks like, right? And, and uh, I mean, I think it's actually a very relevant um, application case in practice. So, well, I mean, I, I give you here some examples like web page classification, speech recognition, bioinformatics. Um, I, I, think, I think it's also especially important in um, in like medical applications because you know very often you would have just a lot of data um, yeah you have a lot of data but you don't really have a lot of labels right so if you think about medical applications it, 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 it often would be very easy to get a, a lot of data but then you would actually need experts to label these cases and yeah and I mean you know then there would be applications where you just get some people on the Amazon Mechanical Turk to do it but then in um, medical applications, yeah, you need a doctor to do it, doctors don't have a lot of time, so maybe you say, look, I have these 5,000 cases that I got out of your database, but then the doctor maybe can label only 100 cases or something like that, and that's basically where then semi-supervised learning methods would um, be useful, helpful. So, well, there's two concepts that I want to mention, so, so two main settings, one would be the um, transductive setting where we basically just try to um, predict the labels for these unlabeled classes that we have and then the inductive setting where we use all the data that we have to predict new cases. Um, I, I mean I must say to me it's kind of the same thing in some way but, um, but anyway so in the semi-supervised uh, literature they have this distinction between transductive and inductive. Um, yeah so we are making that one as well. Um, yeah, and, and now there's, well, I mean, now obviously if I tell you, look, um, I have this problem, I have some labeled instances, I have some unlabeled instances, what is kind of the first thing that comes to your mind how to do that? Well, in the end, it's some sort of a data imputation problem, right? So you just say, well, okay, we are going to try to impute the labels. So how, how do we do that? Well, so in this self-labeling framework that it's called. The idea is basically, so you see you've got the training set, labeled examples, unlabeled examples. So you build a classifier just on only your labeled examples, right? So now you've got that classifier, you can use that to classify the unlabeled examples. And now you say, well, so the classifier probably works well on some of the of these cases and not so well on others. So now I basically just take the examples that I um, just classified and, and I only take the examples where I'm kind of most confident about the classification, right? So, so if you have a, a classifier that gives you some sort of a, a probability, you just say, well, just the examples where, where the classifier seems to be really sure about, I say, okay, I can label those and then I put them into my training set and I retrain the classifier again and I do this kind of in an iterative manner. And in this way, I, I kind of just grow my label training set. Um, yeah, and, and this is kind of how the self-labeling works, right? So I, I must say there's also quite some other methods uh, to do uh, semi-supervised classification, but I'm actually not covering them too much. So 
uh, we only do self-labeled methods. So basically, and, and be because the good thing about this is that it's kind of a wrapper method, right? So you can use any classifier that you want and you just use it in this self-labeled framework that you just use the classifier to iteratively label new um, instances. And then you have a semi-supervised uh, learning method. Yeah. So the idea of the package is you can take any classifier that you have and make it into a semi-supervised classifier. Um, well, so what I just explained is basically, that's kind of the standard vanilla self-training, right? So we have one classifier, so that's why it says here single classifier single. Uh, only one learning paradigm, it teaches itself and we do it in an incremental way. That basically means that we have no way of removing instances from the training set, right? So, so, so if you think about it, maybe very early on, your classifier just did some stupid things, but you added them into the training set. So you have kind of no way of removing that noise from the training set, right? Because it's incremental, you are only adding. So there are some other paradigms um, that we implemented in the package that kind of, you know, do all this in, in a bit of better way. So for example, this um, method called setRed. Uh, so this uses an addition mechanism that is called amending. So this basically can also remove instances from the training set um, if, if it thinks that they are outliers and, and it's not, uh, and they should be removed. So that's a bit more flexible. Uh, yeah, this is a similar method, but it, it is actually fixed to, I think, to KNN as a base classifier. And then you would have these methods that are a bit more um, interesting in the sense that, for example, the tree training, the, the way it works is that you build three classifiers at the same time. Um, and you always use two classifiers to label instances for the third classifier, right? So basically you say, well, I, 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 I build two classifiers and if they coincide in the predictions that they make on a particular unlabeled instance, then I say I can label this instance and I use it for the third classifier as a labeled instance. Um, yeah, so, so in this way, so you would basically do like mutual teaching. So you have some classifiers that label instances for other classifiers. And, and, and now the difference is that the tree training and the co-bagging, they still stick to one kind of learning paradigm, which means in the tree training, if you use, uh, if you use let's say, a tree or an SVM, so it would be three trees, three SVMs, something like that. And now in the democratic um, co-learning, there you would use different algorithms, right? So you could have an SVM labeling instances for a tree, um, or yeah, or KNN labeling instances for the uh, SVM, things like that, right? So it's it's all different algorithms in the literature, and we kind of you know did a literature research, um, implemented all of these methods in in the package, um, and there they are ready to use, right? So now uh, one thing, so in the package it has kind of two interfaces: the specific interface and the generic interface. You will probably al always ever have to use the specific interface. So the generic, the specific interface is actually implemented using the generic interface, but the generic interface is still available, yeah, as kind of this flexibility trade-off, right? So, so, and and then it's it's actually pretty simple, right? So we have here these six um, functions that you can use for the training. They all have their uh, their own predict functions, just in a normal kind of uh, interface, um, yeah, just in the normal, like you build the model and then you predict type of interface. And, well, and, okay, and, um, okay, I think I get to that in a moment. Well, so, so maybe I show you an example. So this is kind of pretty old school data, um, partitioning, you know, no tidyverse in YFD or nothing. It's basically just we use the wine data set that we actually included in the package. And now we basically just do like 50% training, 50% testing instances. And then we remove, and, and well, so, so this data set, it, it has all the labels, right? So to make it semi-supervised, we just remove labels from 70% of the instances in our training data set. Um, yeah, so that's just like the pre-processing. 
And now the idea is, so here, up, up here, that's kind of the, the main thing. So now we basically use the KNN3 learner from the current package. Um, and we just give it like the train instances and the train labels. Um, and now this self-training basically just trains this KNN3 in this iterative way of adding the instances, uh, labeling instances and iteratively adding them to the um, training set. And, and now one thing that we implemented in the package as well is that you, you can actually use not only um, raw data for the training, but you can also use a distance matrix or a kernel matrix. So, so the idea behind that is that, um, so actually the research that we did and for which we developed this package was kind of time series related. So if you think about time series, you would very often do something like you use uh, KNN with DTW distance function and DTW just takes ages to compute. So the idea is you can pre-compute these distance matrices so that you don't have to compute them over and over again. Uh, so you can also use it with distance matrices and kernel matrices, but you don't have to. So if you only want to use it with the data, that's obviously possible. Um, yeah, and, and now here I show you, like, for example, to use the democratic, you could do something like, well, we have three learners, a KNN3, a KSVM, and a C5.0. Um, well, they all have their predict functions, and, and you can also like, specify parameters for all of these um, different learners, and then it basically just applies a democratic um, co-learning. Yeah, in this... Uh, semi-supervised way. I, and, and what I mentioned before about the generic interface, so, so now you could even want to do something like you have a method um, that you want to use with the data and you have another method that you want to use with distance functions, uh, with distance matrices, and if you want to do things like that, then you have to go back to the generic interface, right? So, um, yeah, okay, so we actually run some tests with that. Um, yeah, so we do the inductive and the transductive classification. Anyway, so, so, so basically the idea is now, well, um, so we had 30% of labeled instances, 70% of unlabeled instances, and then we had our test set. So now obviously one thing that we can do is we, we just build a classifier supervised classifier on the 30% of the data, and this is this red line that you see here, right? So this is kind of the baseline that is just only supervised, no semi-supervised things involved. Um, yeah, and, and now you see that, that if we now use the semi-supervised paradigm where we, where we use the 70% of unlabeled data that we have, we actually um, are quite a lot better than the baseline, except this one but this one uses a KNN as a baseline. Uh, this one uses, in, so this method is fixed to the KNN as a base classifier, and it seems that maybe KNN is just not a good classifier for this data set. Um, yeah, and I mean, that is kind of uh, similar analysis, just with kind of uh, uh, along different data sets. And I think with this, I'm pretty much concluding so, yeah, so the idea is that we have this SSC um, package in R, it is on CRAN. Um, you can use it for semi-supervised classification in the self-labeled uh, way. Um, yeah, you can do transductive and inductive classification. It is a wrapper package, which means you can use it with whatever classifier that you may have that is a supervised classifier. Um, yeah, we have this generic and the more specialized interface so that it's really like very flexible for any type of self-labeled um, method. And well, we ran some experiments that hopefully have shown you that if you have a lot of unlabeled data, then it's good to do semi-supervised classification instead of just supervised classification with your labeled data. That's it. Thanks very much. A great talk, Christoph. Any questions? Yeah?
Yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you have a classifier that tells you, you, you know, a classifier, but so you cannot use a classifier that just tells you it's this class. You need a classifier that tells you 80% it's this class, 20% it's this class, and then you just specify a threshold and say if it's above 80%, then I say that's confident, and I add these examples, and the ones that are less, I don't add them. Yeah, it's a supervised classifier, so that uses only the label data. Yeah, look, I mean, that's basically touching on, like, the base of semi-supervised classification. So, you know, of course you could say, oh, well, maybe it's not working. But, well, I mean, <laughs> a, a lot of people use it. It, it seems to work, and, and I, I understand. <laughs> I, I understand this, this comment, but, um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, of course it's not going to work always, and of course there could be all weird things in your data that make it not work. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, as I'm saying, it's, that's kind of a very general discussion to have around semi-supervised learning. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think there's definitely cases, for example, if you look at this case, I mean, obviously we made that up, but here it's very understandable that the unlabeled data will help you, right? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yes? Ah, yeah, very good question. Okay, ah, yeah, I should actually repeat the question for the recording. So the, the question is, what is kind of the minimum amount of labeled instances that you can have? Um, well, I, I mean, it's true. If you, looked, if you look at our example, right, so we had something like we use 30% of labeled instances. Of course, I could say, well, let's say we use 70, 80% of labeled instances, and then maybe this plot would, would look a lot like that this plot would maybe look a lot like we are actually not adding any value, right? So, and, and now, of course, you could also say, well, what happens if you just start with, let's say, just one labeled instance, right? Then you probably have all sorts of problems that it's not going to work. Um, so, I know, so we actually got to this uh, through a field which is called... Uh, uh, so, so, where you basically just have a positive class and you start to grow that and you actually start with one instance. So we would often start just with one instance and uh, it, yeah, it could work, but, but sure, I mean, in the end, it's a very valid question. And, and, and I think the idea would be often that, you know, um, labeling instances, in many, very often it would be costly but not impossible. So you would just start labeling instances and then maybe um, if you see it doesn't work, then maybe you label some more. <laughs> Something like that, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks.